Welcome to Life Astrologer. I'm Anna Isabel, and I am so excited to have with me today the wonderful Felicity Warner, who is a soul midwife. Felicity, welcome to Life Astrologer. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. It's it's um it's rather beautiful looking at you. You're wearing all these wonderful blues and you know it's just so perfect for somebody who is well has so much pisces here <laughs> i certainly do yes i in fact this might make you laugh but i've just come back from the beach i had to have a swim <laughs> i'm much happier in the water than i am on the land so i i just went off and had the most delicious swim in the sea and um feeling all all full of you know the right vibes again which is lovely <laughs> i've got a thunderstorm going just at the moment oh well as i was getting out of the water i looked at the heavens and they were very dark and very brooding so i got back just in time i think <laughs> I, you were very lucky and i think the uh, the sound the accompanying soundtrack for our interview is the rumbling of thunder i don't know if uh, our audience <laughs> can hear it <laughs> very atmospheric <laughs> very atmospheric um well i i mentioned pisces because you are a pisces and you have the moon in pisces you were born at the new moon and um and it's funny because the the very first time i interviewed you you had a vision you said to have um, a midwife, a soul midwife in every NHS hospital. Yes. yes. And, and, it's, and I, I was thinking about the new moon, you know, and sowing seeds for new things, you know, that impetus to start new. And, and I don't know that you've managed, but I do know that from different people, um, some of my students who have studied with you or um, either directly or indirectly because of people you've taught. And I, I can think, I, I think is there's one at least who's looking at um, starting something in a hospice now. So <laughs> I, you know, the seeds you've sown, um, they're ger germinating far and wide. Oh, they are, it's, um... It's a constant source of, of amazement and pleasure and gratitude that these hopes and dreams that I've had over the years for the care of the dying and how we revision death and dying, they've grown and there's a sort of a snowball effect now because so many other people have joined that that energy field and are, are really rolling with, with it. So it, it's an extraordinary feeling. Um, I'm just so happy that others have really kind of joined this collective. So it's lovely to hear that you, you have these contacts that we share between us and, and you know of the work that's being done. It's, it's, it's a joy for me, it really is. Well, it's... Um there's so many thoughts you know racing through my head um but the i guess i'd better um contain them so that i make sense <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and the first first thought is is this pisces is the last sign of the zodiac and it's about the end of a cycle and it's not a sign that we associate with death directly. That would be Scorpio. Yeah. So we, you know, somebody at first might expect to see your chart heavy with Scorpio because, oh. you know, what you do is you, you work with the dying. But, you know, I think really the clue is in the, in the title of what you do, soul midwife. Yeah, I think that in your mind, your this is not about death. No. It's about transitioning from one one phase of existence into another. It's and and I think 
it's it's so Piscean when I think about it like that. It completely makes sense because it's about the closing of a cycle yes. and within it, the seeds for a new cycle. Because when we think about Pisces in February, for instance, now those of us who are gardeners will know that contrary to what everybody might think that in February we're, we've got our feet up and aren't doing anything, it's not the case. We are either planning the next season or we've already got started. We might have things going in the greenhouse, we might have uh, propagators, you know, but we're certainly sowing the seeds for the next season in the time of Pisces. So I think in that light, it makes absolute sense that there's Pisces so strongly here. Well, that's very, very interesting. That's a, such a fascinating interpretation. And I, I certainly hadn't thought about it in those terms. What? But now that you've said that, that makes an enormous amount of sense to me because I have always had a vision of death of not being the absolute ending. And I not only that, but I also see the whole kind of journey towards death as such a, an enriching journey potentially and a journey that really we can uh, work with very creatively at soul level. And so I, I think that's so astute of you and it's very refreshing to hear um, that put in that way, that resonates deeply with me, it certainly does. I think, and, I guess we haven't been explicit about what you do, and I think I'd better explain a little bit about it um, for our audience. Um, those of you who haven't, who don't know about Felicity's work, um, Felicity helps people prepare, terminally ill people to prepare um, for their death, to make it as smooth and I guess comfortable as possible mm -hmm. but you also work with the families mm -hmm. so that let's say everything is ironed out yes and that the bereavements at least are not complicated yes yes that's uh, beautifully explained thank you i have um I have such a sense as well that that we it's so helpful to be offering to families um, a feeling of safety, a feeling of extreme care, a feeling of tenderness. I feel that when we can support people at a really deep and very caring level, then we can really turn the event of death and dying, which so many people are so frightened of, into something that becomes an incredibly special um, and very healing event for people. And I think that's really behind the ethos of everything that I do is, is really trying to explain that death can be such an extraordinary event and so healing for a whole family and a community. Um, and that when we really love and support people through that process, extraordinary and quite miraculous things happen often. So, yeah, I, I'm, I, I really love how you put that. that. That really sits well. The key word you used there for me was the word healing. Mm -hmm. And I think when I consider all the signs of the zodiac, the sign I most associate with healing is Pisces at the level that we're talking about, because we're talking about not healing in a medical sense oh. and not necessarily, if it's not exclusively in a psychological sense, oh. it's mind and, and spirit. Yeah. And 
in motion. Yeah. It's at that level. It's a very beautiful and holistic way of healing. And I do associate that with Pisces. Oh, well, that's very interesting. I mean, yes, the whole um, focus on this work is very one to one with a dying person, but also them bringing in their family dynamics and their whole family and loved ones around them as well. And it's looking at them as the whole person, not the disease that they're suffering with, which is giving them the terminal diagnosis. It's really being completely holistic. And the healing aspect really, in some ways, is to make people who make people feel whole again. And that, of course, is the origin of the word healing and whole it's and holistic it is to make them feel whole again mm -hmm. and I really feel in the work that I do and my colleagues as well that we are we are in some ways um healing a fractured person who has gone through life you know we're all fractured by life's you know turn of events um, and there is definitely a healing aspect to this end of life process. Um, so that that again sits very deeply within me. It's again, there is something else that is emphasizing this, and that is Neptune, the ruler of Pisces, in a, a beautiful trine to the moon um, and yes, yeah, specifically the moon, um, not so much the sun, although the sun gets brought in by virtue of the fact that it's so close to the moon. Um, so a Neptune is the ruler of Pisces. It, he's the God of the sea and it's about having no boundaries. And I think, you know, the process of going through the zo Zodiac is from individual growing into an individual within society mm -hmm. and contributing to society and then going back into the source which is what where Pisces comes in it's the return to the source and Neptune epitomizes this it, it's the it's the the real symbol of the if you think about what the sea is it's it seems to us boundless now i know that it's it's contained within the planet due to gravity and um and so on but you know we also know it reclaims land and you know it's you can't really contain the sea it's 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 the other way around the sea reclaims land um as much as we we might find that there is um, there, there is the odd island born due to volcanic eruption in the middle of the sea. Um, we know that the sea reclaims land. So it's this, this powerful force mm. that seems to us to be boundless within, within our planet. Obviously, we're not talking about the solar system or the, the universe, but even within our planet, it seems boundless. And I think it's it erodes when we think about when I was talking about it reclaiming what it's doing is it's eroding and what's it eroding it's eroding boundaries it's taking mm -hmm. it's taking things back onto itself and right through we we always think of water you know life beginning in water so onto water it's returning when it's reclaiming the land mm -hmm. so there's that symbolism that's very strong and very powerful and it's right there working beautifully with a Pisces. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing um, because of that, that word that's cropped up, boundaries. Now that's a big one in my life because I, I feel like a, like a floating being for very much of the time, I feel very boundaryless. And in a way, going back to being a soul midwife, that's an interesting one because we sit side by side with our work within the clinical system and clinical care. It's wonderful and it, it brings so much to to the work of death and dying, obviously, but it does have very clear boundaries. 
Now I've always come in and especially with my students have said, forget the boundaries, go, go to where you need to be and to where that person you're working with needs to take you as well. And that's a bit frightening for some people. You know, you, you have to dare to do that sometimes. You have to step out of your comfort zone and maybe swim into very deep water where you don't know actually where you're going, where the light doesn't shine because of the depth. And I think that's a very interesting parallel when you're working with people at soul level, you are dealing, you are diving very, very deep into the psyche, into the soul area. So that is very interesting that Neptune is showing up like that. Um, and um, I, I really, really understand what that means for me, certainly. Well, it's, I was wondering where this Aries comes in because you have Mercury and you have Venus in Aries and this is kind of the warrior. And oh. it's about, about courage. And also, um, funnily enough, um, you have the sun in a fairly tight square with Mars. And, I, and, and so Mars, again, the warrior. And when you have the sun square Mars, I... I don't know what a Pisces does with this because, <laughs> you know, the sun square Mars usually gets very irritated and can get very irritated very quickly. Oh, uh, yes. Can be quite explosive. I don't know what you do, whether you dissolve it in water or what do you do with this? <laughs> I'm laughing again uh, because this is me to a T, probably. Um, you know, there is this sort of um, soft, dreamy Piscean um which is very much in me but I always feel I have a lot of fire in me too and of course the fire and the water can produce a lot of steam <laughs> and um and and hot air I suppose um yes uh I I can I can confess I, why not confess I will I I do have a fiery side to me I can I'm very quick I I I think very, very, very quickly. And if people aren't keeping up with me, that can be highly irritating for me. My poor husband, you know, if he doesn't get it immediately, what I'm trying to tell him, I can, I can feel quite, quite grumpy and quite sort of fizzy. <laughs> so um, yes, I, I, that's, that's very interesting that you've, you've, mentioned that and spotted that because I think a lot of people um feel that I am the sort of the soft the dreamy the 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 compassionate but I but actually there's a lot of there is a lot of warrior energy within me and certainly I've had to work with that um in in creating the idea of soul midwives because it was so um new when it first started and and the system the establishment didn't get it at all and I've had to really push and work with quite a lot of fire to to bring it to birth it into the world so that's that's interesting again so I'm going to add to this because you were talking about thinking very quickly well you have mercury in aries so i you know that's mercury is about our thought processes how we think and aries never does anything slow i think it thinks slow is is something to be banned actually um, yes. <laughs> so it's it's about speed so you're thinking quickly and perhaps you know instinctively as well this is it's an instinct that operates there. And then you have Mars in the sign of Gemini, which is Mercury's own sign. Um, and Gemini is, is also, it's about communication, it's about thinking. So I can imagine that you can verbalize frustration and impatience um, quite readily. Yes. Oh, I certainly can. I really can. And there is a joke actually within the family. This is, I always say that a job will take five minutes 
and and my family dissolve in horror around me because you know they say well we need to get x y and z done well I said well that's fine that's only going to take five minutes and it's partly because for me everything does take about five minutes you know let's let's write another book let's um do this let's do that five minutes well not exactly five minutes but in my head everything will be a quick process and it will be very straightforward and why on earth would it take longer than it needs to <laughs> so there it is and i think you know it's interesting because mars and gemini um you you're i don't think you're capable of doing one thing only i think to do one thing only would be like putting you in a cell um it's it's you have to be able to do lots of things especially also as i noticed that um the moon is square jupiter oh and in the third house so there's just okay so let me just explain that because that's quite a lot so coming back to mars it this all weaves together very beautifully so coming back to mars mars is about action it's about how we assert ourselves and in Gemini is verbal. So it's all about logic and and then communication. So you would assert yourself, I think, through being able to communicate. That's how you would assert yourself. Mm -hmm. And then, and I think that when I asked you, what do you do with all this anger and frustration? I think actually, um, once you once the heat of it calms down, you do the rational thing. You, you might have had some heated words, but then you do the rational thing. And the rational thing, and here's, this is really important. The rational thing for you, because Mars is in the ninth house, which is a house that we associate with belief and religion. Mm -hmm. And because you have, again, now Jupiter, which is in Sagittarius, Mm -hmm. The natural house of Sagittarius is the ninth house. So you see the two married together. And, and so it's Jupiter in Sagittarius, very strong on conviction and belief. Mm -hmm. In the third house, the house of communication. So no wonder you write about your, your beliefs. You're going to write about your beliefs. Um, Mars in the ninth house is somewhat of a crusader. <laughs> because it's... <laughs> about bringing your beliefs into the world and here's the thing that's really important it's about conviction it's it's jupiter and sagittarius it's about conviction mars in the ninth house conviction again and then there's the square to your moon and i think what that says to me is that you your logic is going to be centered around an incredibly high moral ideal. Oh. Mm. And that sometimes the frustration you feel is with yourself. Oh. Because, well, being human and having Mercury and Aries, sometimes the words that come out are not the words that your higher ideal might have wished for, shall we say? Yeah. Does that? That makes sense. It does. It does. I mean, um, oh, I certainly have um, it, uh, huge impatience with myself. I, I would say, um, oh, my goodness, you know, the number of times that um, teachers or um, doctors have said to me, you are your own worst enemy. You know, you just you, you've got such. Um, um, you're so single-minded about things and and you have such a sort of you 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 think you know exactly what what you should be doing or not be doing that actually that works against me sometimes it can be it can be very helpful because it means I can really get the energy to get things done but it can it does have its downside as well you know I can really um uh trip myself up um very well by being um too singular and too focused about some aspects to do with myself usually and and then I will be the one that suffers <laughs> so um that's that's very interesting mm. it, it's it's because the ideal is so 
hugely important. Yeah. And you know, something you said to me um, in the first interview that I did with you years back, um, which because of my own work really struck a chord. And, the, and what you said was that for every hour that you spend with a dying person and someone who, and, and their family, you need another hour to do something completely different and that is joyful and light so that you can continue to do the work that you do. And so I have to wonder mm -hmm. how good you are at doing this because that moon Jupiter square and then the sun square to Mars, the temptation to say yes to everything oh. impulsively without thinking about it is so strong that I can see you with your diary needing more hours than 24 on any <laughs> given Honestly, I don't know what to say. This is so accurate. I am the world's worst person at being able to say no. Do you know, I have to make myself practice sometimes. F, you do not have to say yes to everything. You can say no and you can say it smilingly. But this kind of impish streak in me can't bear not to do that one extra thing because it will be so interesting or so fascinating or just because I want the experience of it. So it's really hard for me to say no to things. But I would say that I, the older I get, I really do have to have this time alone to rebalance and realign. And the protection of my own energy is really important to me that's a constant challenge I have to work at it um, because I am a tigger I'm a I'm a I am so wanting to just be out enjoying and doing things that are interesting to me you know I have many many interests and I don't want to have to rest or shut down or not do something so I do overload my diary certainly but then I literally have to flake out and have a snooze or a nap or, or do some meditation or listen to music just, just to get myself back into a sort of good routine again. <laughs> so it's, that's, that's amazing that you could see that from my chart. I'm astonished. I really am. Because normally the reason Pisces can't say no is because they don't want to upset anybody or let anybody down. But but I think actually you've got more of a sense of boundaries than that. And because what you said is something that I, I can completely understand with you, Mars in, in Gemini and, and the Jupiter in Sagittarius so strong here, is that you want to live many lives in one go. <laughs> Absolutely. hundred percent. It's this hunger, and you said it, to experience everything. It's just, and that is the exuberance of your energy, which sparkles. And, it, <laughs> and, it's, and that's the, the beauty of it. And I think what makes you so good at what you do. But of course, you have to remember that, you know, you, you do have a body. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's it's very hard. It's very hard for me to remember I have a body because a lot of me lives out here somewhere. And this in a way goes back to the boundaries again. You know, I don't even feel I have the boundaries of the physical body a lot of the time. I feel, um, yeah, quite unphysical, um, which is, maybe that's to do with being a fish. I don't know, you know, I can swim all over the place and do and swim in and out of various dimensions and parallel realities. That's all quite comfortable for me to be doing. 
So, um, yes, um, remembering to have the physical body and to look after it is quite, that's quite a challenge for me, it really is. The biggest one, of course, uh, being to rest, you know, because that, that's the thing, um, yeah. it's rest and to feed yourself as well. Yes. But, you know, there is a saving grace here in your chart. Oh, good. And, and that is a Virgo ascendant. Oh. Um, now, on the one hand, one would say, well, yes, but it's opposite the sun. Um, because, you know, Virgo, and what that represents is that Virgo is the opposite of everything Pisces is, where Pisces is about boundlessness, you know, um, and doesn't do, it, it thinks in whole, um, Virgo wants to break everything down and analyze and it's you know looking at detail um, and everything but the one thing that Virgo is I think my experience of Virgo ascendants is that they tend to be very good at organizing being organized mm -hmm. and and crucially I think in term in the context of our conversation very health oriented oh that's interesting and so i think it's no accident in a sense that you are working in in hospitals albeit not in a medical capacity mm -hmm. you're but you're still in a medical environment yeah um doing healing the pisces way yes yes but i think you do have an awareness of physicality you have to do what you do you just need to make sure that you're applying it to yourself yeah absolutely i mean yes this is interesting the whole virgo um stream of consciousness there i i i for, for a lot of my early life i i just um i didn't organize and i didn't make lists and I didn't tidy my cupboards and I didn't have my shoes all sorted. The odd thing is I got to the age of about 40 and suddenly Virgo arrived. I don't know what age I actually was because I don't I'm not very good at dates or times. I'm completely unnumeric. <laughs> But suddenly it was very important to me to file things and to have things in a place where I could find them. And this took me completely by surprise because this wasn't the me I knew at all. So something was obviously kicking in a little bit late in the day. But now I have to say I get unbridled pleasure from having all my bank statements filed in the right place. <laughs> or my clothes kind of in the right order in my wardrobe. Now, this is not the me that I used to know. So whether or not something has happened to turn me into that later in life, I don't know. Does my chart give any clues or? It, it would if it, it, I, we can work on that um, later on. But um, with what I would say is that you have the sun and the moon in the sixth house and the sixth house echoes Virgo themes. And it's about coming into, um, it's about the, the mundane organization of life. Oh. And, and I, you know, I'm not surprised that you being a Pisces with the sun opposite your ascendant in Virgo in the sixth house, that this didn't ex immediately uh, oh. appeal to you but I think we grow into our sun signs and perhaps oh. there's a, an appreciation of organization there which then because the, the fact is if you want to, to do and achieve the number of things that you want to do and achieve well there's only one thing for it <laughs> organized yeah, I think that that has hit the nail on the head. Certainly, it was a case of sink or swim. You know, if I did not get organized and get my head around that, then I I would have just sunk because I have so many 
balls up in the air all the time and I'm doing so much juggling and I'm working on things in the sort of current moment and I'm working on projects which might be happening in two or three years time and I'm I, and I love all that I, I thrive on the on the sort of all, all these things happening but unless the nuts and the bolts are sorted of course it all falls flat so that is funny and, and I laugh at myself for enjoying the mundane experiences of life which I would never have done earlier so for instance in my kitchen my kilner jars are all sort of at the right level and they I keep them stocked with the lentils and the rice you know where as I say where did this come from when I was in my 20s or 30s I would have thought, what a waste of time. But now there's pride <laughs> that they, they're all looking all right and they're nice and clean. <laughs> so. you know what? I, I have a confession to make. I have a Virgo ascendant like you. I have an absolute love of Kilner jars. <sighs> and, <laughs> and they are neatly organized, just as you describe. <laughs> well, there you are. How funny is that? I love it. <laughs> now, the other aspect of the sixth house and, and Virgo as well is, is the idea of service oh. and of wanting to be of service to others. And clearly what you do is you provide a service. And, and I think it's, it's interesting to see, to say the least, that Pluto in Virgo is in the 12th house. Now, it's in Virgo, but there's an entire generation of us with Pluto in Virgo. So not quite as personal as you might think. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I think it's like you've taken the signature of our generation and done something with it, which is the idea of bringing healing and service mm. to the 12th house, which is the house that we might associate with both Neptune and Pisces. Oh. It's the closing of the circle yet again. And why that's significant is because Pluto is the planet we actually would associate with death. Oh, that's, that's, yeah. I need to process some of this that's big but it, it's I think like a piece of rock the thing that runs all the way through me is about being in service and it is about being service to 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 people to the planet I was thinking about this this morning because somebody rang up and um heard that I was helping someone who's at end of life at the moment but someone I haven't seen for a very long time. And she said, why, 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 why would you be out there helping her at the moment? Because, you know, she's, she's, you know, you haven't seen her for a long time. And why would you feel? And I said, oh, because that's what I do. I'm, I'm here to do that. And, I, and I, 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 don't know how to choose my words I don't want it to sound like I think I'm a sort of you know come come to look it isn't exactly like that but I feel that I came to be in service and and that my work is my outlet for that and I will every day when I wake up I am in service and that has never never left me I think I've had that all my life on some deep unacknowledged level level probably but I remember being a small child and feeling like that which is is odd because I you know at the time you think everybody feels like that don't you but I've always had that so it is a bit curious and it, it's a bit hard to articulate that um without feeling quite uncomfortable that uh, that's touching quite a a raw nerve I feel uncomfortable talking about this but it's a very strong part of who I am and why I do my work and and in a way why I can't think of ever stopping it you know I some people say well you could retire now why why do you make yourself work so hard well I can't not <laughs> so um maybe that, that is, relates I, to that 
it is the essence of who you are and everything that you believe. And I think, you know, you can't retire that. That's just not something you retire. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I was looking at, at Pluto in that, that 12th house is because here you have Pluto, the significator of death, sitting in the house that represents exactly what we're saying, the returning to the source. And I think for you, again, it's that's exactly what you do for people. You help them at the end of their lives through the process of, re of returning to source. I cannot think of a more beautiful service that you could provide than to make somebody's passing as comfortable as possible at every level and to help their families through it. It's, it, requires a, it requires the quality, the most beautiful quality of Pisces, which is, uh, it's more than just empathy, it's compassion. It's deep compassion, which is what I associate with universal love. Mm. So to be able to do that mm. is, a, is, a, is a gift. And so Felicity, I, I, you know, retire, what retirement? This is who you are. <laughs> oh, thank you. That feels like permission. I, and I, I accept that very gratefully. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's... It, it is it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to talk about all of that because um underneath all the all the words and all the all the stuff I do there is something in me that is so um absolutely emotionally attached to be doing this work and to go on developing it to see it not as as it's not even finished yet. It, it's work in progress, all this work. And you've touched me enormously by talking about helping people return to source, because yes, that is absolutely how I feel in that midwife role. It is about returning back home again, returning home and in and in good shape <laughs> and i think that's another part of of the really subliminal work of a soul midwife is about is about returning someone home in good shape so discovering their soul wounds and helping them to heal those along the way discovering what baggage they have that they don't need to take with them um, discovering how they felt about themselves and helping them to understand what their life was about and why they were here and what they have been while they've been here it's all part of the job really um, it's it's very you know we look after people as they're dying yes but it's all about really making that journey towards death very very special as well um and that that that's where the service comes in definitely yes and you do more than that of course because with mars and gemini in the ninth house you know that's classic for teaching you know you're you, you know the teaching um of others yes and you would be a, a, a teacher that speaks with passion and conviction with that Mars and Gemini. Oh, uh, it's been a surprise in my life because I didn't really go to school. I had a very unconventional childhood <laughs> and I, um, I seem to slip through all the normality nets really. And um, I didn't go to school, so I've never been taught properly, but one of the great joys in my life is teaching. And um, I don't really know how you do it properly. I'm not a textbook teacher, but, but to be able to just, um, open people's hearts and tell them about how this work works is I, I just love to be able to teach I really really love doing that. I would do that all day every day you know it just that enriches my soul as well well you have Gemini on the midheaven so you know the fact that this is uh, so close to your heart it, you know in an area of the chart that's linked with vocation uh, 
is is a no real surprise. So it's, it's all there. Wow. Well, my, my father was a Gemini and um, he died last year and he was a great orator, great, um, great speaker, public speaker. And I've always sort of felt that maybe I got it from him. I, I didn't know. But I, again, since I was a little, little girl, I've been out there sort of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> in in quite sort of an odd way you know I, I always was able to sort of hold forth at school and 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 speak about things and um you know even when I was very tiny so it has been there a long time <laughs> definitely I think that it, it must be said too that it's the sign associated with writing as well and so and you have um, written a few books I think uh, yeah, I have and writing another one at the moment and of course before that I started life out as a journalist um, and that was a sort of my my number one dream had always been um, to to be a doctor but actually my education well there wasn't education <laughs> because of family circumstances I I didn't go to school after the age of 13 so I didn't take exams but I um but writing has always been such a passion for me and so I've been very lucky that I was able to work as a health journalist with and to be writing about people who were who were going through um, treatments and, and having various sort of conditions. So I was able to weave in the writing with, with the health and, and, the, and the, the love of listening to people's stories and then, you know, getting them out into the world. So in a funny way, although I never knew I would end up working in this world of death and dying, you know, that was never never something I set out to do exactly it all kind of happened and I look back and there is a whole pathway which led to this so it I do feel that fate kind of had a hand in all of this from very very early on um, and all I've had to do really is trust trust it and go with it there's always been that sense somewhere so much you just said there, the very fact that you were interested in, in being a doctor, again, what did I read from the beginning, the interest in health that we I mentioned with the yes. and, and then you end up as a journalist, you know, classic um, Gemini stuff. Um, and then it's it's about health. You're writing about health. It's yeah. so it's all there. I wonder. Because you talked about your education being interrupted at the age of 13. Mm. And I wonder whether perhaps you were having to care for people within your family. Oh, yes, I certainly was. That was the whole beginning of, of my death and dying work. My parents divorced when I was six and I went to live with my grandmother in Cornwall and she brought me up and she was just amazing. She was also Piscean, um, <laughs> interestingly, and she was an only child. I was an only child. My father was an only child. Um, there was a whole long line of us. Um, she brought me up and was amazing um, and I had this very sort of free range life. Life. Um, I mean, I did go to school then, but she developed lung cancer when I was um, 13. Um, and then everything really um, went out of kilter after that. So I supported her for her final year. Uh, we didn't know that it was her final year, but it became evident. She, we didn't talk about the fact she was dying ever. So I looked after her more as she gently looked after me less. And we sort of met in the middle somewhere. And that was my first, um, my first sort of experience of, of death and dying. So I really learned so much through her. She was such a teacher. And I saw her the night she died. And um, it was so awful that I knew then that I had to do something when I, when I was a grown up. I would make sure that people died well because it, it was so gruesome and grim in this 
hospital she was in. Um, it, it really affected me. And I felt very kind of, this is definite. One day I will work to make sure that people die beautifully. And that was in a way a sort of a legacy um, and, and in her memory was was to to do that so uh, in fact I'm the age she was now when she died and that's a curious return for me the fact that she died um, at 62 and I am now 62 and I'm a grandmother myself um, I feel like I have come full circle and I feel I I could stop now I would be able to I'd be allowed to but as I was saying earlier I can't you know I will go on and on and on for hopefully a long time yet but it's it there's an interesting sort of karmic sort of sense there certainly well what you said was that um you feel like your life has kind of gently led you to where you are and i'm looking at your north node which we associate with let's say the the path you know that that we are meant to be taking our purpose um, etc. And it is trining Mars almost exactly, um, which to me says that, how can I put this? Things are in place oh. to help you achieve your purpose. That's and, very curious. And I think, you know, if your parents hadn't divorced, oh. the story would have been different. And I'm looking at that North Node in as much as it's trining Mars, it's also opposite Venus to do with relationships in the seventh house. And why I'm paying attention to that is because I often think that the seventh house is not just the story of our own relationships, uh -huh. but of the first relationship that we are a witness to. And so, and there it is. And I think, and it's in Aries. So that Venus in Aries is speaking of contention and conflict. Um, and so, and it's opposite the North Node, which wants to be all about harmony and, and peace and diplomacy. But I think it's almost as though you had to experience that acrimony. Yes. Bec for so many reasons. And one of them was that you had to learn about taking care of yourself as well as others because it's in the first house so you have to learn how to take care of yourself mm -hmm. and your parents splitting up you're kind of out on a limb yeah. because you're not living with either of them so you have to look after yourself now thankfully you have a paternal grandmother yeah. and it is in the house linked with a paternal grandmother really with yes and um <sighs> And so you have that. And then on top of that, it's in a trine with Mars, which is not, not too far from the midheaven, which is your vocation. So you see all of that was in place. And, and I think you are, when you say you don't want to retire, well, of course you don't, you love what you do. It's an expression of who you are. But crucially, you also said you felt this is what you are meant to be doing. Yeah. And that's, and I can see how your story is there in your chart, but it's there in your history, of course. And, and how you came to arrive at doing, doing and everything being in place there, almost as though all the characters yeah. were in place to mm -hmm. teach you what you needed to learn yeah. in order for you to have the tools that you needed to do what you came here to do and those were your words you're you've come here to do that um you have just said it exactly i have always felt that literally everything that happened along the way and i mean there were many other big events in my life um that led me to where I am now as well because after my grandmother died I went to live abroad I I went to live in Copenhagen with my mother who had then remarried and then her husband suddenly died one day age 36 from a heart attack and again I was thrown into the death sort of energy um had to cope with that and you know there were so many significant events early on 
that I can now see uh, prepared me really for everything that I do now. Um, I, I, I think everything that happened was for a very good reason, although I didn't know it at the time, obviously. And I'm in awe of that slightly, you know, what, what is, what does that tell us? What does that tell us about life and about soul contracts, about, you know, all manner of very interesting things? Um, I think I've been so privileged to have the complexity and the challenges but also the intuition um, and, and spirituality. You know, spirituality has been a big thing in my life all the way through. Um, not, not religious, but an acknowledgement of, of something beyond us that, that interacts with us at soul level. So all of that has, has come in to everything that I have felt and everything that I do now really as well. <laughs> well, conversation uh, began one morning. I believe I was uh, it, it began one morning. Um, it's it's I'll have to explain myself. This conversation that we are having is due to uh, me driving, me being on my way to a radio um, studio where I was doing a, I was taking doing a phone in, an astrology phone in, in Kent. And on the way there, I was listening to Radio 4 in the days when they still did things I actually wanted to hear. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and there you were being interviewed. Um, it was at nine o'clock in the morning, I think. Uh, it was the nine o'clock um, slot where they used to do, I can't remember the name, but they did, you know, do wonderful things. And one of the wonderful things that they did was interview you. And at the time I was doing, um, I was doing uh, Lightways for My Spirit Radio. And I thought, I have to have you on. <laughs> so this conversation began that morning. It began on a, normally I would have been working at that time. Um, but I was on my way to um, work when I heard. How extraordinary. So, and it's, it's quite funny in a way because that's a very mercurial experience in itself. I was um, on my way to somewhere, that's mercury, travel. I was traveling to somewhere. And where was I traveling to? I was traveling to a radio studio um, to do a, a radio program, um, also very mercury. And by the way, just to make things even neater, I have Mars and Gemini like you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love the way the universe works. How amazing. <gasps> Nicely together. Um, I recognize a fellow soul that I, I wanted to uh, connect with. Yes. Um, so there it is. Oh, in God. fact, no, it wasn't for lightways, it was for mind matters. That's what it was for. It was for mind matters, um, which was about um, mental health issues. Oh, and I, that's why I thought you have, to, you have to be on mind matters. So now we can't top that, can we? It's <laughs> wonderful. I love it. You couldn't even make this up, could you? You know, it just... <laughs> of how astrology weaves everything together and um and i think on this note i want to say felicity warner thank you please tell our audience how they can find you oh well thank you so much this has been extraordinary um i you can find me gosh you can find me i, I have a website which is www.soulmidwives.co.uk um so come, come and visit me there and and you can see how to send me an email or whatever love hearing from people love love being really involved with with everyone's story so so come and find me that would be 
absolutely wonderful, really would. And, and I usually have a school running, but with COVID, that's all a bit funny, but I do run lots and lots of courses on this work. And at the moment they're all on Zoom, but they're, they're great. I mean, they're going really well. You know, you'll, you'll still get the vibe from, from the Zoom. So it'd be lovely to see you. And I'll be sure to put that link um, on the notes that accompany this episode. Felicity Warner, once again, thank you very much. You've been watching Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel, and my wonderful guest, Felicity Warner. And I, I cannot tell you who is going to be on next. Um, <laughs> because I'm not sure yet, but whoever it is, we're going to have a great time. Have a, a lovely rest of the week and see you next time. Mm -hmm.